good hand washing technique. Could be a surgeon, I don't know yet. Oh, oh, oh. Well, calling for help is the right thing. That's the first thing you want to do in these types of situations. His juggler vein's been cut. Does anyone have a clean cloth? How does he know it's the juggler vein? That's pretty impressive. That's great. Putting pressure on a wound like this is the first thing you need to do outside of obviously calling for help. Anything you can do to stop the bleeding, put pressure on the site is important in order to help that person survive. You're killing him. I'm saving his life, he was bleeding out. No, you have it in the wrong place. I think I remember enough of anatomy 101 to know where the jugular vein is. Ooh. He would be in the right place if he were an adult. He's not an adult, he is a boy, which means you're also putting pressure on his trachea, which means he's not currently breathing. I can't really see where his hands are, but it's good advice. There. <gasps> Don't take it out. Some glass. Don't take it out. He'll be fine. Yeah. Who are you? Hello, I'm Dr. Sean Murphy. I'm a surgical resident at San Jose St. Bonaventure Hospital. Well, hello, Dr. Sean. Nice to meet you. By the way, just so you know, if you have an object inserted into you, object, I know that sounds kind of weird. If you get stabbed with a knife, if some glass goes inside of you, if a nail goes inside of you, never pull it out. Make sure you call 911, let the paramedics decide what to do, let them take you to the nearest hospital, because a lot of times what that object is doing is preventing you from bleeding out because it's putting pressure on the spot where the artery or vein was cut. A special meeting of the board of directors, as much as I love you all, questioning one of my hiring decisions. Did you bother to look up the definition of president while you were skimming the dictionary? And you're hiring him to be a surgical resident. My department over my objection. The bureaucracy that you're seeing here is real. There are board members, there's presidents, there's employees, there's uh, trust funds. So these things exist. They put a lot of pressure on doctors and presidents to make certain decisions. Yes, he has autism, but he also has savant syndrome. Genius level skills in several areas. He has almost perfect recall. He has spatial intelligence and he sees things and analyzes things in ways that, that are just remarkable, in ways that we can't even begin to understand. Those are assets, undeniable assets for any doctor, particularly a surgeon. I'm not gonna lie, I agree with the president on that. As a surgeon, it's more important to have very good spatial ability, to be able to have perfect recall, to understand the anatomy perfectly, than it probably is to explain the complexity of a, of a specific case and be able to communicate well with people. Most of the time, when you're a surgeon, your patient is not awake. That being said, I think it is still important for surgeons to be able to improve their communication skills, to be able to talk to patients, help them understand the risks and benefits of operations, and make sure that they don't force patients to go into the knife when they don't have to. You seen her? No, now go away and turn off the light. Sure. Ooh. <sighs> Resident beef. Resident beef. <laughs> oh. I need you to, um. <laughs> I heard. And here I thought this was gonna be an all medical show, no Grey's Anatomy drama. At least where I practice medicine, there's different on call rooms for males and females. There are times where one of the call rooms may be unavailable, and you do have to have a male and a female sleeping in a room together. Usually it's not a problem, but this is unprofessional, folks gonna lead to drama. Lots of drama. We don't have a relationship. We have sex. But... You have a sexual relationship. I wish I had vision like that. That's impressive. Venous distension is caused by increased intrathoracic pressure inside the chest cavity. He's basically saying the veins and the arms are swollen, so he thinks there's some extra pressure going on inside the, uh, the chest cavity. It can be because of uh, cardiac tamponade, which means that there's blood, usually in a, in a traumatic sense like this, inside the pericardial tissue, which is the lining of the heart, and there could be blood in there and it makes the heart unable to beat properly. 
the veins in the boy's left arm are popping. Is that bad? I, I don't see. Intrathoracic pressure. No, his chest is rising. He's breathing. No, the, the, the chest is moving paradoxically. Paradoxical chest movement is a consequence of something known as flail chest. If you get a trauma where a section of your ribs break from the rest of the ribs. That part of the rib cage doesn't move normally when you take a deep breath in and deep breath out. So the, the chest sort of moves paradoxically. That's what he's talking about. What happens during a pneumothorax, one of the lungs collapses or sometimes both of the lungs collapse and you can't oxygenate that area, meaning that when you breathe, no oxygen goes to that area. It causes increased pressure. The life-saving treatment for this is to literally insert a needle in order to release some of that pressure. Who here has a sharp knife? Oh! Blade five inches or longer? Nobody? Is he gonna go into the second or fourth intercostal space? Can't be back here. Oh, I need a knife. <laughs> He's going to TSA. A knife? Sure. Anything else? I do also need a narrow six-foot tube and high-proof alcohol and gloves and baggage handling tape, but I'm going to get the alcohol from the duty-free store and the tube from the back of the soda machine. He's going to put a chest tube for a traumatic pneumothorax. Looks like he's going to a party with all that Jim Bean. He reminds me of Zac Efron a little bit. I know it's a weird thought to have in the middle of this medical emergency, but I don't know. I always found that blowing to the glove thing really obnoxious. How much bacteria do you have in your mouth? Probably even more than your fingers. I, you're blowing inside the glove, but you're getting some of that bacteria on the outside of the glove that you want clean or relatively clean when you're gonna go insert a chest tube into a young boy. He's gonna clean his hands with the Jim Bean, but that's not perfect. Incision should take place two ribs down. Second intercostal space, my man. He's actually following proper technique because you want to stay in the mid axillary line, meaning in the middle of your armpit. That way you have a lower probability of hitting the heart when you go in with the scalpel or whatever you're going in with. Okay, well why the bottom? The air will continue to leak and accumulate until the damage can be properly repaired. The tube allows the air to get out, the water in the bottle stops the air from coming back in. A homemade one-way valve. <laughs> He's breathing. <laughs> you saved his life. He saved his life. Attention pneumothorax. You can literally put a needle in that can release some air and that equilibrium does enough of a job. You didn't need all of this fancy technology here. I need to get to San Jose St. Bonaventure Hospital. That's where we're going. Good. One of the classic uh, signs that someone has autism or may have autism is they don't make great eye contact. They're not great at picking up social cues. If you find out that your child has autism, you can start them in these early intervention programs where they teach them how to mimic some of these social cues where they're not looking to make eye contact with you like we do normally because we have good uh, physical recognition and body language recognition, but they do so because they're trained to do so, to make conversation seem more normal. Early intervention has shown some very promising results for those with autism. Find another school. No, we won't, because nothing's gonna change. They can't handle them, and I don't blame them, because obviously we can't handle them either. What the hell happened this time? What happened? You're hurting him. <laughs> what did you do? Those who have autism and grow up with pets actually have better results moving forward in terms of communication, in terms of interpersonal ability. So if your child does have autism, getting them a pet early on definitely serves a benefit. It changed. The boys ECG changed. It's the same, 86 BPM. No, it used to be higher. No, it used to be 86, it's still 86. It used to come up to here. That's not the right way to do it. You have to be seated, you have to have calipers, you have to be looking at the strip and comparing the little boxes on the screen. Maybe this guy, he has superhuman powers, it's possible, but in reality, you need to be a lot more careful because this isn't just a game, it's people's lives at risk. Eight-year-old healthy boy, status post-encounter with a shattered glass sign, numerous lacerations. Echo. Get him set up in trauma three with an EKG, full blood work and a PAM scan. So far, very accurate, I'm very impressed. The way that 
The paramedic told the history, very, very accurate. Adam needs an echocardiogram. No, behave yourself, or you'll be removed from the building. I don't know what to make of this guy. I like him because he's superhuman and knows everything, but it's just so unrealistic, it's crazy. Is this the same security guard who knows everywhere he's gonna go? Maybe this guy's a savant too. Do an echo. Sir, the boy's wide open, it's gonna take a while. Good, that'll give me time to figure out why the hell we're doing an echo. Dr. Brown, you're with me. We're gonna go find your weird guy. Keep him stable. Surgeons just don't go and look for another doctor or someone else on the street that wanted to give them a recommendation on how to treat this patient. I noticed that there was a slight reduction in the intensity of the electrocardiogram. The electrical flow, I noticed that too. The heart rate was the same, but the amplitude dropped. Pericardial effusion. Reduced cardiac output. Would stress other organs. Causing them to shut down. Yes. So just to break that down, pericardial effusion. Um, peri means surrounding the heart, the tissue surrounding the heart. Sometimes there's fluid there, and when there's fluid there, that makes it difficult for the heart to beat, and you get cardiac tamponade. That's what I was talking about earlier. Again. Again. There. It looks normal to me. <laughs> it's not normal. Four doctors are looking at a scan. They don't believe there to be an issue. This guy comes in, sees an issue with the scan that no one else sees, and now all of a sudden they're starting to believe him that maybe it could be that. If you're looking at the scan, it either is or it isn't. I don't know what they're debating about the concavity that's open to interpretation. I've, I've never seen a situation like this. The YouTube clip already has over 200,000 views. That's pretty good, 200,000 views. The more I think about what he did there uh, in the airport, the more I think it's inappropriate, there is a good Samaritan law that's in place to help with basic emergencies, pulling some out of someone out of a burning car, and in the process you hurt their back, but you were trying to save them. But performing an advanced medical procedure, like putting in a chest tube, especially a makeshift chest tube like that, man, unless he saves the boy and it's 100% safe, there, there's gonna be malpractice and lawyers involved in that case. So. The good doctor strikes again. You saved that boy's life. Oh, good. His name is Adam. Traumatic pneumothorax. I'm hungry. Sean, Dr. Melendez's team is going into surgery. I mean, if you're interested. I mean, how about getting him to sign all the paperwork and disclosures and HIPAA forms and making sure he has identification? Put your mask on. Put your mask on, Sean. I saw a lot of surgeons in medical school. You're much better than them. I have a lot to learn from you. You're very arrogant. <laughs> Matter of fact. Do you think that helps you be a good surgeon? Does it hurt you as a person? Is it worth it? And there you have it. First episode of The Good Doctor. Things I definitely enjoyed about the show, number one, it's fairly medically accurate. The drama in the show is interesting. It kept my attention and I, I wanted to see more what would happen. I really dig the fact that it gave an inside look into how hard living with autism can be. You know, you can have abusive family, you, you have bullying that's happening. Dealing with autism is a difficult situation and I appreciate that the show highlights that. I will say, however, that they almost make him look superhuman and that's not realistic, so that's definitely a con in my book. But I understand that it needs to, they need that factor to make the show work. It does not look like a comfortable sleeping position. <laughs> I wish I was this happy when I woke up early in the morning. What is he measuring? Where to? San Jose St. Bonaventure Hospital. I'm a surgical resident. Today's my first full day. I'm at floor. 
<laughs> I like this show. I don't know. It gets me happy. It just puts me in a good mood. This is Mitchell Brand. I reviewed his chart. He's 55 years old from Chicago, divorced with two children. You did a radical prostatectomy on him yesterday. This is actually very accurate. Uh, in a post-op unit, you will get visited by the attending physician, the head physician, who's usually the main surgeon, and they will have their residents following them along. Here in this case, the patient had a radical prostatectomy, which is a removal of the entire prostate gland. I have a whole video on the prostate and how things can go wrong with it. So if you want to check that out on my channel, the thing about the radical prostatectomy, why it's a difficult surgery is because there's a lot of nerves in the region of the prostate amongst other structures that are very anatomically important, including your urinary system, your semen duct. Going in to perform that surgery, you want to make sure that anatomically, you're very careful not to damage the surrounding structures. But as we know, things can go wrong and things happen. You're late. Five minutes, we've all been. On your first day, no less. It is your responsibility to be here. If you were not, you have failed in your responsibility, which makes it your fault. Okay, how can it be my fault? I did nothing wrong, the bus. No. This is gonna work out great. The board clearly made the right choice in hiring you. Thank you. I think the attending is being mean, but on the other hand, I think he's right. As a doctor, it's very important to be on time. There should be no excuses because ideally you should be there early. Being a good resident, it's ideal to get places early so that you can review the charts beforehand, get all the information so that when you are rounding with your attending, you know all the information. It's definitely abutting the aorta and the left kidney. Renal angial myolipoma? You see an extensive blood supply? No. God, I wish I could do this. She has a sarcoma, a malignant tumor. Malignant? That means it's killing me, right? Yes. I get that it may have features of a malignant sarcoma, but to know instantly uh, without a proper biopsy, it, it could be several things. So that's it? You just accept my answer at face value? Why? You're very arrogant. <laughs> arrogant people don't think they need to lie. How long will this be? Seven minutes. <laughs> Without any complications, it takes seven minutes to do a discharge examination properly. Dr. Dunsmere has already cleared him to go, and we need the bed. Okay. Protocol requires that the surgical department also clears him. Why is a patient that has an ear infection admitted into the hospital? And question number two, why is a patient that has an ear infection being treated by a member of the surgical team? What are you doing down here? I'm waiting for her to fart. She had Flat abdominal shots. surgery. But I'm using the word fart in front of the patient to be more casual. But you're the president <laughs> of the hospital, so I'll say flatulence to you. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Why are you doing that? She had her deviated septum repaired. Before we can release her, we have to be sure she isn't suffering from post-operative ileus. Post-operative ileus is when the muscles of the intestines don't move correctly. Uh, and it basically, it's like a frozen intestine meaning that the, the gut is not moving the food and its remnants and the stool further down and allowing it to pass. This can happen sometimes. Uh, one of the first things you wait is for the patient to pass gas. And then in some cases, if you had something more complicated like a, uh, an abdominal surgery, you wait for them to have a stool before sending them home. I think that was it. You don't have to smell it. I don't think so. I'll wait a little longer. This is important. No, it's not. The procedure is called a laparotomy. Um, yeah, your heart sounds good. I don't know what she was listening to her heart for. That was definitely just an add-on for the show. But when we listen to the heart, uh, we listen in multiple areas. When you're listening to one area, you're listening to one part of the heart. Then you move the stethoscope around and you're getting the other part of the heart, which gives you more information. And then you move it to the other side of the chest where you're listening to uh, separate arteries. So you can hear what the aorta is doing, what you can hear what the pulmonary valve is doing. My husband died in a car accident a couple of years ago. Mark is our only child. I can't die right before his wedding. I can't. You're not gonna die. Making promises like that, I've said it before, it's not wise. We have only so much control over certain things, especially they don't know the grade of this tumor, they don't know the spread of the tumor. A little girl has a tummy ache because mommy and daddy won't stop fighting. This isn't a medical issue, send them home. Could be intestinal malrotation, which could quickly become fatal. And every patient in this hospital could have malaria. 
Well, that doesn't mean we're gonna go around testing for every condition we think they could have. Ordering random tests just to make sure that a patient doesn't have that condition is certainly not smart, and I agree with the senior attending here. What you learn from experience is when you go on a hunt uh, and you start ordering a bunch of tests, certain tests will come up positive, mostly because a lot of those tests uh, have the the high possibility of coming back as false positives, which then encourages you to order more tests, which has several effects. The patient gets anxiety. Second, some tests carry risks. For example, if you start ordering CAT scans on every patient, you're exposing the patient to unnecessary radiation. On top of that, you may find on a CAT scan some kind of nodule, some kind of node, which will need further testing, sometimes a biopsy. Biopsies carry risks. You see where I'm going with this? From now on, you don't run any tests you don't have to run. How do I know if a test is needed until after I run it? She'll tell you. Nurses actually have a lot of experience in knowing what tests to run, which tests are excessive, which tests are very important. In fact, when uh, residents in my hospital ran uh, rapid responses, the nurses from the ICU were so experienced, they already knew what medications to pull up at what dosages, even more so than some of the young residents. I'm Dr. Claire Brown. I'm first assist today and I'll be leading the timeout. Patient's name? Stephanie Willis. Scheduled surgery? Excision of an indeterminate retroperitoneal tube. Oh, now it's indeterminate. We don't anticipate any complications with the surgery. Thank you, Dr. Brown. That timeout actually happens. It's basically we confirm all of the information. Generally, we do it while the patient's awake so they can confirm all this information. And then we do it one more time before we start, including this may surprise you, discussing the site of the operation. Because it has happened, unfortunately, horribly, that we've operated on the wrong side of a patient's body. There's been a lot of things put in place, procedures put in place that prevent us from making that horrible mistake, with the timeout being one of the most important ones. It might be infected. It's not. There is some discoloration. He's 82 years old. Everything is discolored. <laughs> Blood pressure 120 over 70, heart rate 60. She's holding steady. I have opened the fascia. You know what you guys should do? You should screenshot this little scene where she says, I opened the fascia and send it to Gabby Hanna because she tweeted me not so long ago saying that she can't believe that after we operate on organs and we put them back, are they just like floating around in our bodies? And I told her that everything is interconnected with fascia and she had no idea what fascia looks like. So send her this picture on her Twitter. She's gonna love it. I thought you'd wanna see it. It looks like puke. <laughs> no, 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 it's not the regular color. The puke is a regular color. Yeah. It is a bit of an unusual color. We could order some. I'm sending you home. Are you sure? <laughs> this is so good. Part of medicine and a big part of medicine and something that I learned and teach my students is that a big part of what we do is reassure because people worry and there's a lot of anxiety that comes with people's bodies. Uh, fluids start coming out of random places. Uh, fluids change color. We bleed, uh, body aches. Our heads hurt, our vision changes, a cough occurs, upset stomach. As soon as you go on the internet and you look at any one of these websites, you can fall down into a wormhole thinking that your headache is caused by a tumor like this. Claire, tell me you got something. I've got nothing. This tumor is way bigger than it looked on the scans. Hence why we don't diagnose people I, just by looking at I scans. I can't even see her aorta. That's a problem. The tumor is encasing her aorta, meaning it's fully surrounding it and engulfing the aorta, which serves to be the main blood supply to the bottom of the body. Dr. Melendez sent you a biopsy. When will the results be ready? When I get to it. It's very important. They're all very important. Let me see the other test orders. I'll tell you which ones are most important and you can do them in that order. I'll be honest and fair. In complex surgeries like this, we not only have the pathology lab on standby, but you could also even have a pathologist in the room with a microscope ready to make the call immediately, especially when a patient is under uh, sedation. You don't want to extend the patient's time under sedation just because the pathologist is busy with other cases. There is one possibility. If we remove the left kidney, we might be able to get a good enough view to successfully remove the mass. Tell you how a healthy kidney to get a better view. That's insane.
The tricky part with this is that if they're not successful, she could die. If they're somewhat successful, she could be incredibly disabled and have horrible disability from the surgery. And her last six weeks to live with this horrible tumor are gonna be awful, as opposed to if they just suture her up now and then she can enjoy her last few weeks of life. Even if the surgery is a major success, does that mean that they were able to get the entire tumor out and now she's completely cured? It could be spread all across the peritoneum, which is the inside of the abdominal cavity. To me, this sounds too risky and too much of a, like a cowboy move, but then again, I'm not a surgeon nor a surgical oncologist. That's why I would ask someone who's more of a subspecialist, which I don't think any of these people are. A am I healthy? Probably. You're a doctor. You're, you're supposed to know. No, we're not. Nobody knows anything for sure. Anybody could drop dead of a heart attack at any time. Who is this guy? Am I, am I gonna have a heart attack? First of all, don't do this in an open space like this, because if he starts yelling, it's not gonna look good for anybody. I have these conversations all the time. Patients come in and they demand to know that they're healthy and there's nothing wrong with them. You can't promise that. What I can do is answer a specific question they have about their health. Doctor, my ear hurts. Why do you think that is? And I could say, well, I looked in your ear and I found that you have an ear infection. Let's treat it and see what the outcome is. You give them reassurance that it's likely to pass, but you tell them if the symptoms continue, if the symptoms are to worsen, if new symptoms appear, please return so we can do a further evaluation. That's it. The small bowel is twisted around the superior mesenteric artery. Martine needs surgery immediately. We need to confirm with Dr. Melendez. No, nope. Dr. Melendez is in surgery. Part of Martine's bowel is dying and killing her with it. No, you cannot make these calls on your own. Dr. Melendez was very clear. He was very clear. It's past midnight, which means it's tomorrow, which means you're no longer my boss. Is this the OR scheduler? Yes, this is Dr. Murphy. Prepare an OR for surgery. As feel good as this is, an intern cannot just book an OR, can't schedule their own surgery. No one would ever allow this to happen. Actually, this could be grounds for expulsion from a surgical program. Why do all surgeons look so frail in these shows? Him, McDreamy. I mean, I get you're operating all the time, but come on. A little deadlift and bench press never. Oh, he got a mattress. Look at that upgrade. I think you may need a new mentor. I'm dying. Ooh, that took a turn. I know I only watched the first two episodes with you guys, and now I'm on the 18th, and it feels like I'm skipping around like crazy, but this was voted the number one episode by Episode Ninja, so I feel like I had to check it out. Don't judge me. I'm excited. 12 to 18 months. And I'd appreciate it if you didn't tell anyone. I want to know okay, the diagnosis. I, I will in my own time. Okay, have you had a full workup? Yes, of course. It could be a secondary tumor metastasized to your brain from somewhere else. It could be a primary tumor, which means that it originated in the brain, or it could be a secondary tumor, let's say a lung tumor that started in the lungs through the lymphatic system or the blood went into the brain and then created a secondary tumor. You should get a second opinion. Sean, I've been a neurosurgeon for 30 years. I think that qualifies as a second opinion. <laughs> you know what's interesting about being a doctor who's practiced 30 something years as a neurosurgeon, you actually make really bad decisions when it comes to your own health. It's notorious that doctors are really bad patients and I totally agree with this, I'm the worst. And in fact, if I have a patient that I'm treating and I know is a doctor, I know I'm gonna have to take extra time. I know I'm gonna have to do a little arguing with them in order to get them to take care of themselves properly. Well, given the degree of the rotation and the fact that the break is almost compound, I say we're dealing with a bimalleolar or trimalleolar fracture. Very good, what else? Um, Color? Blood flow is restricted. It's for dying. Oh, no. So they're talking about this ankle fracture. When there's lack of blood flow, that means there's pressure being put on the arteries or veins in that area, which is very dangerous because that's called uh, vascular compromise, meaning not enough blood is going to that area. And that area is necrosing or dying. I'm going to have to reset it now. Hold his leg. When they say resetting, it's exactly what you think it is. Just gonna take a second, I need you to count to three. One. One, two. <laughs> I think that was kind of accurate. I don't know, even my scream match. <laughs> Shouldn't I be asleep for this? Well, your blood alcohol level complicates anesthesia. And we think you have a concussion, so 
We want to keep you responsive. We didn't give you a regional nerve block, so you shouldn't feel anything. This is actually similar to what we do when we do a C-section. Uh, the mother is not asleep. We do a regional block just like this. We need the mother conscious in case we need to make decisions uh, so that she can help facilitate the process if anything happens. I had a friend, a neurosurgeon at SF Muni. She looked at the scan, she came to the same diagnosis. Sean, I have an inoperable glioma. Glioma is a type of tumor. When we say a tumor is inoperable, usually that's because the area where it's found, uh, how encompassing is it? You know, if a tumor is spread throughout the entire brain, how are you gonna operate? You can't take out the entire brain. Sometimes if we're very lucky and it's localized to a specific region, we can just take that part out, but even then we're at risk at harming the surrounding structures of the brain and leaving someone with neurological deficits. And you can imagine how awful that could be. Like, yeah, okay, take out my tumor, or help me live, but then I can no longer speak. Horrible, horrible situations. Be reasonable. Beg your pardon? Be reasonable. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, it'll be clear. What the hell happened to Kid? I, I don't know. He twisted his ankle. I, hey, I, you I, lied to me before. You're lying to me now, you spoiled little coward. Hey, hey. Be reasonable. His friend's hurt, he's scared, and you're freaking him out. Good cop, bad cop. The reason good cop, bad cop works so well is exactly uh, based on the principle that I've told you before in some of my Wednesday checkup videos. So if you want someone to see your point of view, you wanna influence someone in a positive way, it's not ideal to put a stone in between you. It's not ideal to just state your argument and be confrontational about it, because that person won't wanna change their beliefs. But now on the other hand, if you can get that person to see that you're on their side, that you have the same intentions, you're also a human and they can be see eye to eye with you, you're more likely to convince them of something. And Good Cop, Bad Cop is a fast track to achieving that goal. We were pledging and there's this, there's this uh, wheel of torture thing you gotta do for initiation. Torture. But it's, mo it's mostly stupid stuff, dude. It's like, like drink a cup of olive oil or eat a tablespoon of cinnamon. Or jump off a roof. And what did Caden land on? Laundry. You had to do laundry? No, like, like you had to... Uh, eat the, those laundry things. Oh my God, Tide Pod As many challenge? as he could in uh, 30 seconds. Detergent, eat detergent. And how many did he have? I don't know, like six, maybe seven, seven. I feel like I shouldn't be here even on a medical channel explaining to you why that's bad. I mean, it's like, don't eat knives, don't eat forks, and don't eat Tide Pods. The only time that I'll say that someone may accidentally ingest a Tide Pod is like if you have a child very young who's not aware and they see a colorful pod and they think it's candy and they swallow it. But if you're an adult or an adolescent and you're eating Tide Pods, come on, you can do better. I know you can. It's my spiel. The trauma SOD is asking for you in OR number two. We got an emergency thoracotomy. Who can give me the remaining steps for closing? Cut anchoring sutures, clear laps, and reposition the valve. Remove clamps from the duodenal resection site, keeping clear of the underlying aorta. When he says clearing laps, what he's talking about are those uh, pads that we use to control the bleeding or to put pressure or to clean the site so that we can actually see what we're doing when a patient has some blood in place. The nurses that are there with us, the assistants that are there with us are counting each one of those laps. Because if we leave one of those in, horrible situation, it'll fester, bacterial infection, all this stuff. So yes, we count every tool, we make sure everything is in, everything is out. We even have like a little wall of pockets, almost like a shoe organizer where we put each one of the things and then we count them out afterwards. While you run the bell for me. When we say run the bowel, what we're doing is we're looking for any injuries to the bowel. Most commonly this happens in a gunshot wound if, it get, if someone gets shot in the abdomen. Right away, the first step in the uh, trauma situation is to open the patient, do an explorative laparotomy, which means like you cut the stomach open, you run the bowel, you see if there's any injury anywhere. Because if there's a lot of blood pooling in the abdomen, the patient could die very quickly and you have to run the bowel quickly, but effectively to make sure that you find the area that's bleeding. Sean, is everything all right? What happened this time? It's gonna bleed somewhere. I want a capsule endoscopy to check the entire length of the bowel for bleeding and leaks and get me a complete coagulation and metabolic profile. A capsule endoscopy is when you take a pill that actually has a camera in it and it takes about 24 hours to go through the system and you get quality photos 
it, it consistently photos and video. It records its way through the, the GI system, which allows you to see if there's any bleeding anywhere. In my past experience, what I've seen is that if someone is bleeding and we suspect it's from an upper GI source, meaning from the stomach, uh, the esophagus, what we do is we do an endoscopy where you put the camera in the mouth and you try and find where that bleed is coming from and you can control that bleed in a number of ways. If you think it's from a lower GI bleed, you could do a colonoscopy, which is just another form of endoscopy where you put a camera up the butt. Not sure if they're doing a capsule endoscopy here just to look cool for TV or because they don't feel comfortable taking him for an endoscopy because he's in a critical state. Now he's getting lab work that is legitimate because when you take detergent, it can mess up the acid base balance in your blood, it can mess with the electrolytes of your blood, and if it messes with them too much, it can kill you. Our patient has disseminated intravascular coagulation. Ooh. Can anyone tell me why that is very bad? Blood clots form throughout the blood vessels and rapidly deplete the body's clotting factors, thereby causing a systematic bleed. It's also a catch-22. If we treat the clotting, he might end up with a terminal bleed. So DIC is actually a very rare condition. It's life-threatening. The last time I saw it was probably my residency when I was at the intensive care unit. And it's a condition where you have excessive clotting going on within the blood vessels. So it's intravascular. And when that happens, you can have organs die, think stroke, uh, pulmonary embolism in the lungs. Just think of it, simply put, as a clotting condition where your body's clotting a lot. And because it's clotting a lot, it's using up all of its clotting factors and platelets, which then makes you more susceptible to bleed. You could have a cross injury from his ankle. Or a bacterial infection he picked up before or during surgery. It might have been set up by drug use. Or we did this to him. And by we, I mean Sean. He spaced out in the OR when he was closing, kind of like he is now. I'm listening. Comforting. He wasn't focused. You got some bad news. About what? It's a personal matter. Sean was distracted by a personal issue. What, did Leah come back? Does she have a new boyfriend? Does Cable get cut off? I have an inoperable glioma. 18 months. There were some surprises on your images. The previous diagnosis was incorrect. You have a glioblastoma multiforme Which is worse. located in your pons. Ugh. I'm sure I don't need to tell you this, but it's the most aggressive form of brain cancer. Oh. We estimate three. Maybe four months. Uh-oh, someone's in trouble. Do you need me to listen to you anymore? No, Sean, you should go. <laughs> Hope is irrelevant for me. Hope is painful. I don't want to spend what's left of my life chasing my tail around in a circle. See, I disagree with him a little bit on the hope aspect. I understand what he's feeling and it's it's part of the process, but hope is really important in the medical community. Hope is very important when you have a disease because when you have hope, you can have a, a more positive mental state and a more positive mental state will give you the best chances irrespective of what illness you have. If you have a cold, you'll feel better sooner if your mental state is better. If you have pain, you'll feel less of it if your mental state is better. So I think maintaining hope is one of those ways nature allows us to have a natural relief of whatever suffering we're going through. So I like to hold out hope. Your tumor is located at the base of your skull. An open cranial biopsy would tell us what's wrong, but there are blood vessels in the way. The biopsy would cause an aneurysm or a bleed. But if we go through your nasal crib reform plate, we can cross the tentorium on the contralateral side and avoid all those blood vessels. We can do a biopsy through your nose. Caden is still alive. And if we can keep it that way, there won't be an m, &M review, which means no one will be asking questions and no one will have to give answers. m, &M is a morbidity and mortality conference that happens if someone gets really sick or dies. We take some of the most complex cases during these meetings, and you have all the residents there, all the doctors that participated in the case, some specialists that are required to attend this, and basically we dissect the case from the beginning to end, trying to figure out what we can do better, learn from our mistakes, use it as a learning opportunity, and I've seen these be incredibly educational, but I've also seen them backfire, see doctors get into near fist fights. Is that from an IV? You did the biopsy. 
I did. We have a low-grade glioma. How did GBM? I told you. Cancer, Sean, it's still cancer. I have to undergo brain surgery, which is really scary because I'm not the one performing it. <laughs> Five days a week for six weeks of radiation, ten more weeks of chemotherapy. And then? And then, with a little luck, you and I can go to the Super Bowl next season. Yay! The patient has pulmonary hypertension. The only treatment is medication, which reduces the lung blood pressure, but not enough. Her heart's failing due to the extra strain. So pulmonary hypertension is exactly what it sounds like. Pulmonary meaning lungs, hypertension meaning high blood pressure. But it gets really tricky when you have high blood pressure within the lungs, because then it puts a lot of strain on your heart to be able to beat against that pressure within the lungs. Oftentimes, once medication fails, the last approach becomes surgical intervention, which is what I expect to happen here. When I say surgical intervention, means a transplant. What about a fix? Isn't it just a transplant? <laughs> nope. There's nothing inherently wrong with Melanie's heart. It's healthy. Just needs a little bit of help. So we're going to leave her current heart inside and slot in another one to support it. Well, it's still a transplant. You tricked us, man. I obviously don't take surgical cases like this. This is outside of my wheelhouse, but it is interesting to hear that this is even a possibility. You can have two hearts beating simultaneously to give it a little bit of extra support. You probably would have to be on blood thinning medication, immunosuppressive medication, because you have more turbulent blood flow. You have uh, an other organ inside of you that your body will probably re react to unless you have immunosuppressive medication on board. I can see a huge challenge coming up here. Do you live in a tent? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I lived in a tent too. It wasn't very good, so I moved to a bus. You should move to a bus. You will be much less likely to develop ulcerative tinea pedis. Tinea pedis, or pedis as he says it, is a fungal infection of the feet. Uh, when it becomes very severe, you can have ulcerative a fungal infection where you actually have breakages in the skin and you can get infections on top of the fungal infection you already have present. It's basically like the worst form of athlete's foot. Treatment for this usually uh, requires oral antifungal medication because topical would not have the enough strength to cover it. Just keep it dry and clean and we'll give you some. Would you rather we continue to discuss this inside? We are discussing things with the patient that are potentially sensitive. We're so done with I the patient. He's actually really right here, even though the fact that he's usually bad at picking up social cues. You should not talk about sensitive issues in front of other people with a patient like this. Even if it's as simple as putting up two little curtains to give them some privacy, or at least a sense of privacy, will make the conversation go a lot smoother and allow the patients to take in the information without feeling like all eyes on them. Good job, Sean. Excuse me, please. Uh -oh. Excuse me, please. Thank you for keeping me waiting. We doctors are busy, important people. Hold on a second. Is that Dr. Cuddy from House? Is this like a crossover event that's happening right now? Look, Dr. Blaze, I am like any other patient, entitled to have a say in my own treatment, but unlike any other patient, I have spent my entire adult life digging into people's brains, so if you think I'm gonna sit around and watch, you're mistaken. Well, if you think you can operate on yourself, I'd happily add you to the list of potential surgeons. Today, you're gonna to be waiting. And waiting. And waiting. Test, test, test. You've had them all before. I want them again, my versions. It's actually really important what she's doing here is that she's not letting herself be bullied into making medical decisions based on just what he wants. She's letting her own clinical experience, her knowledge guide her to make the best decisions for his health. Very often this happens when you have a powerful patient, a VIP patient, someone very wealthy, that they say, oh, I want the absolute best care, I want all the tests, when in reality, that's not in their best interest. And it takes someone with a lot of guts to stand up to that. So I applaud Dr. Blaze slash Dr. Cuddy. What's your name? I'm Harry. 
These are my meds. Those pills are for people with chlamydia, Harry. Oh, you're all the same. See, I, I know better. That's why I had to hide out in the streets. I, I, I had to move next door to Mr. Gooley Eyes. I, I trust him. He's my friend. Why are doctors involved in this and not security staff? Like, if I'm going to any kind of event, they usually bring security with us because there's a lot of medical equipment here. There's medications. Why are the doctors getting involved? Come on, show, get some diesel security dudes and gals and up in there just ah, ah, ah. I trust him. Okay, I, I trust okay. Him. Disorganized he's there, he's thinking, always, paranoia, and delusions. I, I think you have schizophrenia, Harry. Okay, this is my first time I'm gonna call BS on Dr. Sean. As a surgeon, perhaps he can look at someone and figure out the problem right away because it's a problem of plumbing, anatomy, what have you, he can look at a scan. You can't treat humans with mental issues like that. Say this patient is just high on methamphetamine and he's having all of this disorganized, psychotic thinking. Is it schizophrenia? No, it's not. So Dr. Sean, pump those brakes and let a non-surgical doctor take over here. That's an abscess. That smells very bad. So the reason why abscesses smell bad is because you have an infection that already smells bad, but then you have all these inflammatory cells that go in to fight off the infection. And what your body does is it walls off that infection and essentially creates a bubble of pus. And pus never smells good because of the dead bacteria. The only treatment, I and D, incision and drainage. Cut that bad boy open, let it drain out, get the infection out, and then you could start thinking about antibiotics and all that. But you have to drain it. This will give me at least 10 more years. Should give you 10 more years, yes. Mm -hmm. Elliot, I understand your concerns, but... And Dr. Melendez is one of the best cardiac surgeons around. Dr. Andrews told us all about you when he convinced me to come here for surgery instead You spoke to Dr. Andrews. Mm -hmm. And they've both already spent half the morning raving to the press. Well, that's, that's very kind. <laughs> you spoke to the press? You spoke to the patient, my patient. As I explained to Elliot and Melanie, the press attention is a necessary element for funding this surgery. There's a fine line with doing this type of press and exposure. And I understand that line very well because I try and balance my professional life as well as my life as a social media person very diligently, to put it nicely. Sometimes medical systems forget about that line. They forget about that the major mission that we're involved in is helping humans. And while yes, we want to get a better surgical center so we can help more people, we want to create funding for a hospital, notoriety for a hospital. The question needs to be asked is at what cost? Do we discuss this with our patient? Are they on board with having this type of press happening? Is this fair to them? Are we taking advantage of them? And only until you answer those questions, only then you can go ahead and do all this press and notoriety for your hospital. <sighs> Oh my God, is he having meningitis? It's uh, stiff. A stiff neck could be an early indicator of a bacterial meningitis. Mm, there are <laughs> many possible explanations for a stiff neck, most of which are much more likely than bacterial meningitis. If the abscess has invaded the meninges of his brain, it could be exacerbating his paranoia. So bacterial meningitis is inflammation of the meninges, the soft little padding that's found between your brain and the skull. This is quite dangerous because the area inside your skull is very limited so that if you increase pressure, you could actually harm the brain and do damage to the brain. On top of that, that infection can spread from the meninges to the actual brain, to your blood, and cause you to become septic. It's a very dangerous condition that needs to be treated urgently. The way you diagnose it is you go into the spinal cord through a lumbar puncture, and you see and you study the, the spinal tap. So you see if there's white blood cells there, if there's bacteria in there, you do a culture, if there's blood, and it basically points you to if there is a meningitis, what could be the possible cause of it? And then right away, you gotta start being as proactive as possible, starting all the treatments and backing down once you have the guidance as to what the likely cause of the meningitis is. Hey. Melanie has an aortic aneurysm. Two hearts beating into that. Yeah. 
not so good. So I've talked about aortic aneurysms on this channel in the past, but basically what happens is the aorta is the major blood vessels that comes out from the heart that allows it to bring blood to the rest of the body. If you have an aneurysm, you basically have a weakness within the wall that allows ballooning of the last layer of the artery, which means what? If you have more pressure, meaning two hearts beating at the same time, you could actually rupture the aorta. And what happens? You bleed out internally and you die. Perhaps they can fix the aortic aneurysm first and then do the procedure. I don't know how critical this patient is right now. It was my medical opinion that he could have bacterial meningitis. And if you're right, then I owe you an apology. But if you're wrong, then I will be on the phone to Denver and I will make your life infinitely more complicated than you think you're making mine. Why is this such a manipulative situation? For God's sakes, there's a patient's life at stake who could have bacterial meningitis. You're saying if the doctor's wrong by playing it safe, you're gonna give them a bad review? I feel that one of two things is gonna occur. One, it's gonna be viral or aseptic meningitis, which can happen. Or two, by bringing him in and doing all of these things, they're gonna find out that he has another issue that had they not brought him in, he would have passed. Let's see if my prediction is right. Harry has kaleidoscopic disintegration. We <laughs> thought he had what? schizophrenia, but he does not. <sighs> he has a brain tumor. This is why you send patients to the ER, because in the ER with all of those symptoms, in addition to getting a spinal tap, they would have done a head CT and likely done it with contrast to see what's going on inside the brain and would have seen something like a brain tumor. But I don't know what kaleidoscopic disintegration means. Even if he's right with the brain tumor, this is a guessing game. This is not how medicine is practiced. Kind of a shame to see this because in season one, they were so medically accurate in making these diagnoses and how it happens. But here, just because he's finding some symptoms and he's getting these wild theories, did you do a drug screen? Did you see if he's anemic? Did you see if he has a major thyroid tumor causing excess thyroid hormone and that's why he's bouncing around all over the place? There's a lot of things that need to be ruled out, Sean. Have you seen Harry? He lives in a... We need to find Harry, you don't other So those who are diagnosed with autism uh, sometimes have a condition where if there's overstimulation, whether it's light, sounds, even stress, they can sometimes be overwhelmed like this. I totally sympathize with Sean what's happening here because he's trying to do the best for his patient, but clearly it's a struggle. You have a neurological condition too, but yours can be cured. I appreciate the sentimental value here, but he doesn't know that. What if it's a malignant tumor? You just need some surgery, <laughs> then you can be Edward Austin Thomas again. You just need some surgery, just some. Some surgery. Nice. Someone pay attention to the monitors on the show. She's flatlining there. They haven't even made the incision yet and she's already flatlining. Edward has a right parietal brain tumor. Fine, Dr. Lim, you can have OR number two. That's not an emergency operation. When you need surgery, you can go one of two routes. You can go planned or you can go emergent surgery. For example, if you come in uh, with a level one trauma where you got shot or cut inside your abdomen and you need to find the source of the bleed and shut that off, that's emergent surgery. You're not gonna get a lot of pre-testing done to make sure the patient's capable to get through that surgery because they'll die otherwise. So you wanna just do as best as you can in the given moment. But in this scenario, this is not urgent. This patient has lived for a while with this tumor and have been fine. Perhaps it's best to do some pre-surgical testing, figure out if we can optimize them medically, meaning get them on some medications, lower their blood sugar, control their blood pressure, clean them up. Now we just have to wait to see who wakes up. Edward or Harry. See, that is realistic. There are certain tumors, depending on where they're found inside your brain, that can totally change certain aspects of the way you behave. For example, uh, the frontal lobe is uh, what's most important for decision-making and uh, 
control over your urges. So it's not uncommon for a patient who has a frontal lobe tumor to start acting differently, becoming more risk tolerant, meaning that they're gambling more, they're having more uh, sexual relations, unprotected, cheating on their spouses, and then no one knows what's going on. Only until they get properly examined do they find out that they had this tumor the whole time. It's just like playing Surgeon Simulator. Just drop it in, it's all good. Heart. This episode of The Good Doctor is a made up story about a real battle still being fought. Honor the heroes, doctors, nurses, and other frontline workers, many of whom who have given their lives. Do your part, wear a mask. Great message. <laughs> I love the way they're showing the viral particles. They're just spreading out everywhere. That absolutely does happen. That's why it's really important to dab when you cough to try and limit that spread. We've seen it actually spray six feet away from you when you cough or sneeze. And germs have hang time. So you can walk into an empty room that someone just sneezed in and be exposed to those germs. I don't know why I did that. This is such a good example of how germs spread. Droplets, meaning someone coughs or sneezes or speaks. Contact, meaning they coughed on their hands and they touch something, they give it to somebody else. When we talk about disinfecting your hands, wearing a mask, we're talking about decreasing droplet spread and contact spread. Have you seen my ID badge? No. I had it last night, but maybe it fell out of my bag. I lose my ID badge all the time. Like not permanently lose it, but have it in my car, in my trunk, in my suitcase, in my home. Sometimes Bear steals it. Sorry, Bear. Your temperature's almost 101. Your other symptoms? First it was a sore throat, then my body started aching. <coughs> and then there's this cough. I even had my flu shot. Unfortunately, influenza is constantly mutating. The shot always lags behind. Both very accurate statements. In fact, during this time frame in February, I was working in my primary care office. We knew COVID was around, but we didn't think it, it was everywhere yet. So a lot of patients were coming to my practice with upper respiratory viral symptoms, just like this, fever, cough, muscle aches, and we thought they potentially had influenza. We gave them antivirals for influenza. The reality is, even if you had your flu shot, you can still get the flu but your case should be milder. My daughter is very worried that I might have this virus from China. What's it called? Have you been to China or been around anyone who's been to China recently? Those are the questions we were asking. At that time, I think we were referring it to NCOV-19, right? Was it NCOV-19? <laughs> the virus has damaged your mother's lungs. Her body is working harder and harder to breathe, but her blood oxygen levels continue to drop. She definitely has corona. We're doing everything we can to help her. See, that patient was actually in a negative pressure air room. They were isolated from other people because at that point, we were deciding whether COVID-19 was only uh, needed to maintain a droplet precaution where you just cover your face and the patient's face with a mask, or do we need a negative pressure room because COVID was spread through airborne transmission where the virus just lived in aerosolized particles in the air all the time. And what we came to realize is it's more of a droplet spread, but there are some instances where it can be spread through aerosolized particles especially during medical procedures like intubations. You have COVID. <sighs> okay, now what? Now you go home. That's it? That's it. There's no treatment. Stay away from people. Come back if you have trouble breathing. Goodbye. I forget because I don't watch this show regularly how funny Sean is. COVID-19 is a viral illness. So if your oxygen levels are not dropping drastically and you just kind of feel lousy and you have a mild fever, your body is the one that has to fight this off. Like there's very little that we can actually do in the hospital systems. And by keeping you in the hospital, we're actually increasing the risk to healthcare providers and other patients. 25 tests per day. No, just give me one of tomorrow's. Hello? 
<sighs> County Health Department, I don't have time for them, and apparently they don't have time for me. I remember in March, I had a patient who I suspected to have COVID-19, but I didn't have a test available. So I was calling the Department of Health, trying to secure a test for them, eventually getting them a test, finding out that they were in fact positive. Luckily, everyone was wearing a mask at that point, so we decreased the spread, we cleaned the room, sent them out the back door, tried to do our best to limit the spread of this virus. There's just a lot of things we didn't know in the beginning that we know now. If I'm sick, is my baby sick? This disease doesn't really seem to affect children or babies like it does adults. Should we admit her? She's probably safer at home. Once at home, do you have a support system? Can anyone come help you? Good question. Can she get worse? It's just me and the little one. Good doctors always ask questions like this. If I'm sending a patient home that I'm sort of questionable on, and let's say they had a concussion, I always wanna make sure that there's someone to keep an eye on them, that if they become unconscious, they have someone to call for help and to check on them. If I come home, do you want me living with you? Of course, that's the point. Every night after 12 hours of COVID patients to hang out with you and Kellen, and his asthma. Interestingly enough, we've seen conflicting reports on how COVID-19 affects those with asthma. Now, if it's just asthma alone, it doesn't seem to be as bad as we expected it to be, but those who are asthmatic and have other comorbidities like heart disease, obesity, those are the patients that seem to be experiencing worse symptoms and worse outcomes. We do everything we can. We hammer at official channels and every manufacturer's rep that we deal with and see what companies, if any, have undisturbed. Nuts or no nuts? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of a, of a, a meeting with the board. Hey, everyone. I'm just making banana bread. One of the most searched terms in the height of this pandemic was how to make sourdough bread. Go figure, I've never made sourdough bread, I've never Googled it, I don't know who's sitting at home Googling it, but apparently sourdough bread was the thing everyone was making, not banana bread. Your husband's blood oxygen level is dangerously low. That, that, can't, that can't be. So one of the hallmark symptoms of COVID-19 is decreased oxygen saturation in your blood, where you're actually not getting enough oxygen from usually the edema or the scarring that's happening in your lungs as a result of the inflammation that occurs with this virus. One of the dangerous parts of COVID-19 is not only are you infected with this virus that you're fighting off, but some people have an overreaction or a cytokine storm where all these inflammatory cells come to the lungs and actually cause a bigger problem where you can't get enough oxygen going and being delivered to the rest of your body, your vital organs, your liver, your kidneys, your brain, and so forth. Our solution to that was to ventilate, meaning intubate all these patients and as we did that more and more often without treating them with proper medications like we have now and we know which ones work, patients actually got worse on ventilators because we were overventilating people. And it's not because we're stupid or we were intentionally harming people, but it was simply because it's a novel virus and we did not have guidelines on how to best treat patients with it. We were learning about it on the go. We have a surplus of EKG leads? No, we've got a shortage, but that's a problem that can wait. The PPE situation was really dire in the beginning of this pandemic because China was hit first and a lot of our manufacturing facilities are in China. And because of that, they actually redirected all of their shipments to their country because they needed them. And as a result, we we're facing a lot of shortages for gloves, for EKG leads, for swabs, for tests, kits, antibacterial wipes, the vials for injections, the wiring and the tubing for ventilators. There were so many shortages that were happening simultaneously. It was a truly dire situation, especially here in the New York City area. Him rubbing his ears like that is from the mask. Oh my God, in the beginning, just wearing the mask for countless hours, my ears hurt so much. I just remember being so sore. But as we learned to use those little headpieces in the back where you could actually have the mask stay on there as opposed to on your ears, it made the world of a difference. And for those of you who haven't ever worn an N95 mask, they're uncomfortable because they offer more protection. They're more form fitting. You have to get them fit tested, but they also put a lot of pressure on your face. They leave marks. That's why all those pictures were making the rounds of nurses, doctors who were having bruising in that area from just wearing them day in and day out. And a lot of times they were reusing equipment that was meant to be disposable. You work in a hospital? Yes. Could you wait for the next elevator? I appreciate you. 
<laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, in New York, if you ever wore your scrubs out during that period, everyone wanted to say thank you and was quite grateful. And that's amazing. But at the same time, everyone wanted to keep their distance, rightfully so. I understand you don't want to put yourself or your family members at risk, but it didn't feel good that you were being alienated like that. So it's part of the process. My mother is in there, all alone, hooked up to a machine. I just need to see her and, and tell her that I love her. There's a human toll that it takes on family members, not being able to see your family member. And if you're the one ill, not seeing your family members. I will also venture to say and I don't have evidence for this, but I will say that hospital errors do go up if you do not have family members present and advocating on your behalf, especially if you're unconscious. Now, what we've learned from that is we're trying to keep families more updated, trying to keep them involved if they're not there at the bedside through virtual care, giving them scheduled regular phone calls, because we realize that when we're in better communication with the family, we actually get better outcomes for our patients. Pushing Epi. Why is no one doing chest compressions? I don't understand. Do some chest Another compressions. Visual, clear. Do some chest compressions. V-fib now. Did you Hand see those on. horrible chest compressions? She just put her hands on the chest and didn't even compress. Two hundred jewels. Clear. Okay. I don't know what. These people have high-end experts on set. You start chest compressions and then you use a defibrillation. You know, I, I have heard in the beginning of the pandemic because I wasn't in the hospitals, uh, I was seeing patients outpatient, that they were decreasing the amount of chest compressions being done because they were worried about aerosolizing the virus. I actually just looked this up from the Red Cross. Performing chest compressions while wearing proper medical protective equipment, N95 respirators, or like how they have the whole body suit on, still means you should do chest compressions. Like do them, do them, do them. I don't know why they weren't doing them. I was trying to make excuses for them. They should have been doing chest compressions from the start. Any cough? Any fever? No. Any shortness of breath? Sore throat, loss of smell. No, no, none of that. Just, just searing abdominal pain and the runs. I'm pretty sure it's my diverticulitis acting up. <clears throat> my roommate is deeply into pandemic baking. <clears throat> I've avoided coming in. I don't want to catch COVID. So one of the biggest problems we faced uh, during this pandemic was patients not coming into the hospitals. And in the beginning, when we were really overwhelmed, that made a lot of sense. But as we became safer uh, for patients to come in, we had different policies in place in order to decrease spread. Our testing improved, our capacity improved, our PPE improved. We wanted patients to come back because a lot of times when patients delay care, their diseases and conditions get more advanced and as a result become more difficult to treat. Patients who were having uh, some signs of heart attacks were coming in much later. And as a result, some of our mainstays treatments weren't working as well. And the recoveries took longer. One of my main messages over the last two, three months has been to encourage patients to call their primary care offices, to call hospitals, to come in for the symptoms that are bothering them and not wait. It's pink, active, I'm breathing great. In the midst of our research with COVID-19, we actually found that there was limited spread for mother to fetus of COVID-19, meaning that the mother could be testing positive for COVID-19, the baby was usually safe. Now, it doesn't mean there was no spread. There were some case reports of it happening, but for the large majority, we did not want mothers to panic because it wasn't happening. And children in general seem to fare better with this virus anyway. The numbers of children below the age of 10 dying with COVID-19 were spectacularly low. That doesn't mean it's completely benign for them because they could also spread this virus and be vectors, but it is reassuring for mothers, especially with the levels of anxiety that they are facing for themselves. Please don't put your masks on the floor and then put them back on your face. Sean, you're a doctor, buddy. Don't put it on the floor. I talked about germs having hang time, about the uh, hanging out in the air. But folks, after they hang out in the air for those minutes or hours, where do they go? <laughs> right on the floor. Especially if you've been walking around a hospital setting and then you come home with your shoes on. Guess what's on that mask? Man, couldn't they just have me on set for one of these things? Could have helped me make it so much more accurate. Mm -hmm.